Why are we all here? Why is there something instead of nothing? Is there a God? Isn't it clear that those aren't scientific questions and that science doesn't have much to say about them? Welcome back. This particular YouTube video begins with Francis Collins, who was the director of the group that carried out the Human Genome Project, and then shockingly, remarkably, unexpectedly, it ends with a Christmas message. How is this possible? How can these two different ideas connect to each other? I'll give you one clue. It's that truth, goodness, and beauty are interconnected realities. So stick around for the end for the Christmas part. But right now, let's dive into Francis Collins. Check this out. Science is about trying to get rigorous answers to questions about how nature works. And it's a very important process that's actually quite reliable if carried out correctly with generation of hypotheses and testing of those by accumulation of data and then drawing conclusions that are continually revisited to be sure they're right. So if you want to answer questions about how nature works, how biology works, for instance, science is the way to get there. Scientists believe in that, and they are very troubled by a suggestion that other kinds of approaches can be taken to derive truth about nature. And some, I think, have seen faith as therefore a threat to the scientific method and therefore to be resisted. But faith in its proper perspective is really asking a different set of questions. And that's why I don't think there needs to be a conflict here. Uh, the kinds of questions that faith uh, can help one address are more in the philosophical realm. Why are we all here? Why is there something instead of nothing? Is there a God? Isn't it clear that those aren't scientific questions and that science doesn't have much to say about them? But you either have to say, well, those are inappropriate questions and we can't discuss them, or you have to say, we need something besides science uh, to pursue some of the things that humans are curious about. For me, that makes perfect sense. But I think for many scientists, uh, particularly for those who have seen the shrill pronouncements from extreme views that threaten that what they're doing scientifically and feel therefore that they, they can't really uh, include those thoughts uh, into their own uh, worldview, uh, faith can be seen as, uh, as an enemy. And similarly, on the other side, some of my scientific colleagues uh, who are of an atheist persuasion are sometimes using science as a club over the head of believers, basically suggesting that anything that can't be reduced to a scientific question isn't important, and it just represents a superstition and it should be gotten rid of. Part of the problem is, I think the, the extremists have occupied the stage. Uh, those voices are the ones we hear. I think most people are actually kind of comfortable with the idea that science is a reliable way to learn about nature, but it's not the whole story. And there's a place also for religion, for faith, for theology, for philosophy. Uh, but that harmony perspective doesn't get as much attention. Nobody's as interested in harmony as they are in conflict, I'm afraid. Okay, so at this point in the recording, Collins is then asked the question, how specifically did his study of genetics impact his faith? And the answer here is, is surprising. Check it out. My study of genetics certainly tells me incontrovertibly that Darwin was right uh, about the nature of how living things have arrived on the scene by descent from a common ancestor under the influence of natural selection over very long periods of time. Darwin uh, was amazingly uh, insightful given how limited the molecular information he had was. Essentially, it didn't exist. Uh, now with the digital code of DNA, we have the best possible proof of Darwin's theory that he could have imagined. So that certainly tells me something about the nature of living things. But it actually adds to my a sense uh, that this is an answer to a how question, and it leaves the why question still hanging in the air. Other aspects of our universe, I think also uh, for me, as for Einstein, uh, raise questions about the possibility of an intelligence uh, behind all of this. Uh, why is it, for instance, that the constants that determine the behavior of matter and energy, like the gravitational constant, for instance, have precisely the value that they have to in order for there to be any complexity at all in the universe? That is fairly breathtaking, and it's lack of probability of ever having happened. And it does make you think that a mind might have been involved uh, in setting the stage. At the same time, uh, that 
does not imply necessarily that that mind is controlling uh, the specific manipulations uh, of things that are going on in the natural world. In fact, I would very much resist that idea. I think the laws of nature potentially could be the product of a mind. I think that's a defensible perspective. But once those laws are in place, then I think nature goes on and science has the chance to be able to perceive how that works and what its consequences are. All right, so two very quick questions for you to consider. One, why is the science-only view reductionistic? And two, how does the materialist model put forth by atheists fall short in terms of explaining the reality of the world around us? So I'm gonna give you guys three quick examples to kind of unpack those two questions. First, the random eternal existence of matter doesn't inherently provide an explanation for the intricate design features throughout the universe. Atheists themselves acknowledge, love you guys, atheists, you acknowledge the appearance of design at the highest level, but then you trade in the explanation of an actual designer for the inferior explanation of purposeless, unintentional matter. Simply put, when we discover that the universe is filled with information, not just random patterns, but intelligence, intelligence then becomes a better explanation. Two, eternal matter lacks the capacity to account for the existence of consciousness or morality. Consciousness and moral values transcend a merely materialistic realm, showcasing the inadequacy of eternal matter for explaining these realities. Simply put, a moral conscious beginner is a better explanation for moral conscious creatures than an amoral unconscious bit of eternal matter would be. Third, Matter alone doesn't offer a satisfactory basis for the reliability of human reasoning or the existence of universal principles that our minds lead us into, like logic, like mathematics, these things that exist outside of us that we're able to arrive at correctly. These transcendental aspects of reality suggest a non-physical foundation for reality, again, beyond what eternal matter can provide. Simply put, if God gave us the ability to think, then we can trust that thought works. That is, that it is capable of bringing us to the truth because it was intended to do so. In a purely materialistic model, there's no such intention and therefore the reliability of human reasoning is dramatically undercut. So these are just a few light things to consider this holiday season. But you know what? This is my ask. This is my petition to everyone watching this video. Don't just consider these things. Don't leave these in the realm of the abstract and the realm of ideas, but actually bring them into the spiritual part of who you are. Turn these ideas into worship and remember that you, if this is true, are not an accident. You never were. You exist because you were wanted. You were wanted so much so that on a particularly starry night, roughly 2,000 years ago, God came down into his creation. As quietly as snow falling, he entered in. Small and weak and vulnerable, he entered in as a baby, a baby who would one day atone for the sins of the world. So this Christmas season, I am saying glory be to God in the highest for doing small and mysterious things that in time ring out into the hope for all nations. With that being said, Merry Christmas.